Hey, hey, it's Jasmine here. I'm the host of the Female Founder World podcast. Before we get into today's episode, did you know that we have a newsletter? It goes out every single Friday to thousands and thousands of women who are building consumer businesses right now. And what we cover is everything from what's going on in female founder world from the biggest businesses that you're seeing in Business Insider and TechCrunch and really getting into understanding what's happening at those companies and what that means for female-led businesses and consumer businesses in general. And we also dive into the nuts and bolts of how people are getting companies off the ground right now and how they're getting traction in their businesses. It's a free resource. It goes out every week. And I hate to think that you're missing out on this really incredible piece of content. If you want to pop your name down on that list, and I'll make sure that you're emailed every single Friday, you can head to femalefounderworld.com, enter your email address, and you will be on the list. Today's conversation is with two South African entrepreneurs. They are sisters. I'm speaking with Mo and Michelle from Mo's Crib. Mo and Michelle, welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. much for having us. So the first question that I generally ask is just to let founders tell us about their business in their own words. What are you creating over at Mo's Crib? Most Crip is a homeware brand based out in Pretoria um, in South Africa. We basically manufacture homeware products such as laundry baskets, grass trays, um, you know, even outdoor furniture. So we've got quite a host of products that we manufacture. And all of our manufacturing and our business principle is premised around sustainability and conscious um, sourcing of our raw materials. So you'll find that our products, you know, really do solve um, a lot of social issues, um, you know, particularly related to the environment. So yeah, that's basically what we do. And how are you both kind of splitting your roles within the business? You're both working on this together. So Mo, what do you do in the business? So it was really difficult in the beginning to decide who does what. You know, we started the business on a part-time scale and then we quit our jobs about two years ago, just before the pandemic hit us. And we have been doing this full time. I'm working on the creative side of the business and Michelle is more on the operational side. The creative side is where we basically design the products, choose what product categories we're going to be focusing on and also looking at the production. So I also manage the artisans in terms of design and the quality of the production of the products. And then Michelle is really focused on the dispatching of the products, purchasing the packaging needs, you know, your boxes, your tapes, et cetera. And also looking after the warehousing team who are the ones that do the quality checks and make sure that the products that we dispatch are of good order. Let's go back to the beginning of Mo's Crib. How did the idea for this business come about? Well, it's actually quite a funny story. My sister and I were in corporate jobs. My sister is an agricultural economist and she was working at an agricultural firm. I'll let her speak more about that later if she gets the opportunity. And I'm also from a corporate background. I was working as an HR assistant actually in the beginning and then was promoted to HRBP at Nestle. So very big corporate jobs. And one Saturday morning, she mentioned that there was a market that was taking place, a local market called Gamers for Haskenke, which a lot of South Africans will know about. And she invited me to this market. I wasn't even meant to get this invite because it was she was supposed to go with her friend who canceled on her. So I just, you know, accommodated her to the market. And when I got to the market, it was quite intriguing because I found that people were selling handmade goods, you know, goods that they make from hand. And one of the products that stood out for me was a product that was made by using recycled newspaper. And I thought, oh my goodness, I make recycled paper swans, you know, and I could actually come and sell them here. And for a very long time, I'd been making these products, but didn't quite know where to sell them. And so fast forward a year later, we applied to go into the market, really tough market to get into. Even when we went to the interview to apply to get into this market, you know, the owners or the people that were judging at that particular time were mentioning that, you know, this is a really unique product, but you need to have a variety of other products to go along with it in order for you to have a couple of ranges in the stall so that it can be interesting. But lo and behold, they did manage to get us into the show and we did really, really well. We ended up winning the product of the market that year and we sold out in a matter of five days, you know, and I was actually producing a while at the market, which was another selling point. People really liked to see how the product was made. 
And so year on after that, we started introducing other sustainable products made from sustainable material. We started to introduce the PVC baskets, which also did really well the following year and also sold out. And two years later, we introduced a PVC planter. So what we realized from there was that not only were we addressing a very unique selling point, like, you know, selling baskets that are made by hand, but also from sustainable material, what we learned was people were really intrigued about this art and people really were responding really well. And we were making, you know, quite a lot of money, significant amount of money for a market that is just a week old. And so what we decided to do was to take the business full time. And my sister and I quit our jobs in 2019 to focus on the business full time. And I guess she'll tell you more about how then the business became what it is today. Yeah, let's absolutely get into that in a moment. I want to stay on that idea of you quit your job and decided to do this full time because that's a massive risk, especially for two people to um, would be able to sustain you both and that would be fulfilling for you both. Were you just seeing the business kind of hitting at the market and that's what gave you the confidence to go full time into this? Or was there anything else that you guys did to kind of test out whether this could be a bigger business? Did you reach out to some artisans to see if you could build up the supply chain beforehand? Or did you just have a good gut feeling and just jumped in? Well, you know, actually, it wasn't like that. There was not a lot of, you know, traction or, you know, a lot of growth in it or anything at that moment. What happened, though, that I will say that we did was to remain consistent. So because of we were scheduled to do these markets on an annual basis, which was like around December time in South Africa, because at the time we were still working full time, we continued going to those markets while we were working full time. And for a time period, we lived in Switzerland, actually. So there was also quite a big gap, um, you know, in our business, you know, with regards to what we were doing in our personal lives at the time. We moved and lived in Switzerland for almost two years. And while we were in Switzerland, we actually did um, another market in France, in Nantes. Um, there where uh, Mo was just selling her origami art. And so we saw that there was a lot of interest in the product and more so on the whole idea of the sustainability, you know, of the business. And so the market, for instance, that we did in France was not necessarily, you know, major groundbreaking, but then it was also a way in which for us, we can remain consistent in what we're doing. And we just decided that we're going to quit our jobs and do this full time. But I think also the reason we decided we're going to go do this full time is because even though the markets were finished, we'd still have customers write to us and say, I want to order this basket. Where can I get it? And that became a little frustrating because we thought to ourselves, we are here working and studying and people are looking for this product and we can only offer it once a year for a space of like a week. And so we decided to just go ahead and do this business full time. And just a month ago, I was telling Mo that isn't it interesting how we thought that we can actually go into the homeware business when there's so many homeware stores already existing selling baskets, you know, homemade products. So I don't know where we really got that confidence, but it really was a big risk move that we did, um, which was really challenging in the beginning. I'm telling you, Jasmine, but it really paid off in the end. And I think it really was because of the consistency, because there was not really a big drive of, you know, sales necessarily increasing. There was, of course, a consistent interest from our customers that we had met at markets that would write to us throughout the year and would had to send out orders sporadically. But it was not really something that would say really pushed us and said, now you've got enough money to go and start. It was really just a big move, um, a big risk that we took. So the business has come pretty far since then. You're in, I think you're in Crate and Barrel. Is that right? That's correct. And you are also shipping, definitely shipping to the US. I and mean, it looks like you're shipping internationally. I'm just having a look at the website. So you're in Canada as well. That's right. I'm interested in the supply chain side of this and with something that is so intricately made, it looks quite artisanal. How are you kind of beefing up the supply chain side as you are kind of growing the demand for the business? I mean, we beef up as we go, Jasmine. 
you didn't have the right answers because you mentioned before, like, how did you, did you have the answers to supply chain? We didn't have the answers to supply chain. And even when we got the orders from Crate and Barrel, and not just Crate and Barrel, we also supplied to most retail stores of our homeware products in South Africa. And so we were dealing with Crate and Barrel and other stores as well, three plus stores here locally. And so the demand really decides on the capacity. So once we get the purchase orders or once we get the units that we need, we then beef up the training and then go ahead and focus on the production. So we basically chew the elephant in bits. And as you would do in business, you just take it one step at a time. Hey, it's Jasmine, and I'm jumping in to interrupt this episode so that I can invite you to an event in New York City. This is our first in-person event. It's taking place on April 7th at 6 p.m., and it's free. We're hosting this in partnership with Shopify, and it is going to be the ultimate evening curated especially for consumer brand founders or really anyone who's entrepreneurial-minded and interested in the consumer brand space. I absolutely welcome you and would love, love, love to meet you on the night. There's going to be a structured networking event so that you can meet your people, find your people, find other people building amazing businesses without any of the awkwardness. Then we're moving into a panel conversation and I cannot wait to announce the speakers that we have on the panel. It's going to be awesome. So stay tuned for that detail. We're also going to have free food and free drinks available all throughout the evening provided by your favorite woman-owned companies. You have heard from a lot of the founders of those brands on this podcast. So it's going to be awesome for you to try them in person. And this is a totally free event, but you do need to register because numbers are limited. Head to our Instagram account at Female Founder World, hit the link in our bio and sign yourself up. I cannot wait to see you there. Do you have any advice for founders who are interested in engaging artisans to create a product? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Africa as a whole and and South Africa definitely has a lot of artisans that are on the main roads, (laughs) sitting around and playing around with some unique material and making some very amazing products. So you have to also be able to have an eye for that, you know, have an eye for detail, have an eye for uh, artisans that has the will to do it. Even though you can teach them the work, you can't really teach them the attitude. You know, so the attitudes that we have seen in our artisans is that they have a will to do it. Even with huge numbers of units that come around, they're really positive and really want to go for it. So I think you just need to be able to see it in a person that they have a will to do it that they have a creativity side into them, that they are already creating something that is unique, um, something that is not easily available in the market. And that's basically what we've done. You know, we've been able to recruit uh, artisans from the side of the road, believe it or not, uh, that are unique stuff for themselves, selling for themselves. And we've been able to create uh, sustainable jobs for them that pay them monthly. And can you talk us through how, when you first kind of pitched those first retailers, or they came to you, what did you have to have ready to show them? So when Crate and Barrel comes knocking, do you have to already have a product line that's of a certain size? Are there certain margins that you need to have factored in so that you can sell into a retail partner? Do you need to show them like what your artisan, what your supply chain looks like? What did that look like when you first started? When you first started, you know, it was not easy, like, to approach the retailers because, I mean, of course, there's, there's a little bit of skepticism as to whether you'll be able to really fulfill, you know, supply the units, et cetera. And so even before we went into the business full time, we did try to approach some retailers, which was not easy. But once we went in, into the business full time, after doing the market and realizing that we really need to sell mass products, that's when we had to work on you know, our, our brand identity, you know, first and foremost. And I think that that was, you know, one important factor because you have to have something to show. What really helped us was that we we're able to speak to the retailers and say, we've done proof of concept. So we're not just coming to you with a product that we've not sold to anybody, but we know that this product sells. We've sold it for the past X amount of years and it's really done well. And so we believe that this product is actually right for this market. We are ready to now have this product ready, you know, on a national you know, scale. And so we did not have necessarily production lines that we can guarantee that we can make X amount of units 
of course, they ask you how many you can make and you have to really just hit a reasonable number, even if you don't necessarily make that volume yet, because you're still small. But they're obviously asking from a point of view of whether they can trust you as a supplier. But we had to be confident enough to say, we make X amounts of products that we know that we can confidently produce for you. And so that's how it was. We basically had samples of all the product ranges that we have. And from those samples, we're able to talk about different designs, um, you know, customized designs for that particular customer. And so that's how the relationship went. And so what we did notice is that as we continued growing, um, it was very easy for us to get customers, you know, to write to us. And right now what happens that in our inbox, we'll sit with retailers that would email us to say, I've seen your product at the store. Um, I think it's really beautiful. You've got very beautiful branding, beautiful imagery. We would love to partner with you. And so you can really see the difference that you would have to really show that you can really be trusted as a supplier, have good brand identity so that you can really be trusted in the market. And so that's the contrast between the beginning and, you know, where we are right now. And just to really add to Michelle's point, Jasmine, I just want to mention that, you know, in the early stages when you're approaching the wholesalers and the big guys, you know, to get into their stores, you don't really have everything lined up. You don't really know what the profit margins are. You don't know what the cost would be, et cetera. I think what you need to do is just have confidence, like Michelle said, and then also liaise with the retailer to find out what are their profit margins, what are their markups, et cetera, and then go back to the drawing board, look at your cost to making the product, look at your margins, and then add their margins to see if it makes sense, you know, for a customer to be able to purchase that product. You know, you don't always have to have all the answers readily available. You know, and I think what helped us with Crate and Barrel is that we were already supplying in local stores here in South Africa. And so that really helped us in terms of our catalog, in terms of our audits, because they do conduct a lot of audits. And that already had prepared us to go to the big stage with the big guys like Crate and Barrel. I say start small, you know, with the retail guys, even if it's 50 units or 100 units, that really gives you a profile and that really gives you the experience to then be able to approach the bigger guys and then work on it as you go along. But you don't always have to have all the answers. You don't always have to have all the right answers. I mean, we didn't even have a business plan that spoke to what we are doing today, you know, and so it's just really going with the flow and just taking it a day at a time. What is the split in your business at the moment between sales that come through e-commerce and sales that come through wholesale, like as a percentage? Currently right now it's 80% retail and 20% e-commerce. And this is because we've really only started with our e-commerce website last year, August actually. And this is when we just really focused our e-commerce site on the international, which is USA, you know, based sales, because we're really much, very much focused on wholesale. I mean, just to give you perspective, by last year, September, we had only been in wholesale for only a year. So we are only now starting to really build our footing in the wholesale space. And so right now, our focus for this year is, of course, to go to direct consumer um, you know, growing that and we really anticipating to really increase that split by maybe 40, 60, 40 being the direct consumer online e-commerce site uh, with the 60 being wholesale. And so even right now, looking at the fact that our e-commerce, you know, sale contributing about 20 percent towards our revenue, that's pretty good considering that we've just started with very little marketing. Zero marketing. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> But it shows us that e-commerce is definitely the way to go. It's really a route to market currently right now and a viable business model, especially for a startup and with a business that has a product like the ones that we have. Jasmine, I just want to add to Michelle's point to say that the reason why it's a 2080 split is mostly because Michelle and I own 100% of our business. We have not at all received funding from external parties or have any investment whatsoever. Hence why we decided to focus on retail for now. So in order for us to grow our e-commerce side and footprint, we would definitely need to inject a lot of capital into marketing and really beefing up the website. The website that you see now was created by Michelle and I, you know, at night, just trying to put everything together. So everything is all self-made uh, with a very, very low budget. And so we are hoping that as we grow our brand and as we continue to try to grow our direct-to-consumer footprint, we're able to uh, secure the investment to get us to the next point so we can get to that 40-60 split. Let's talk about the pulling the website together yourself. What platform are you guys built on? Shopify or what have you used? 
We're using Shopify. Shopify. And also like for people who are just starting out and to them, maybe direct to consumer is the best way to kind of get started, get a product out there. What are kind of the steps that were involved in taking your product from just being a wholesale product to now having your own e-commerce? Did you have to create the store? You obviously had to shoot product, write the product descriptions. What other things were in that kind of to-do list of moving into e-commerce? I think one of the major things for us was the packaging and the collateral. How do you then present your finished goods to the consumer? You know, this is your opportunity to speak to them, try and get their following on social media if possible, you know, capture them trying to get their email addresses. So having that newsletter, the little newsletter bulletin on your website for them to enter their website so you keep them as a customer, even if they don't purchase they have been on your website. That means there's interest in there. So you should be able to get them as a, as a newsletter contact. And so being able to do that, the collateral, I think is really important. The packaging, it speaks to your brand and also the imagery. You've mentioned that before. So um, taking time to really have those images, the, those brand assets that really speak to your, your overall brand overall. The last question that I ask everyone who comes on the show is to share a resource with us. So this can be a book, a podcast that you listen to, something that's kind of helped you kind of grow your business. And um, Michelle, let's start with you. I would say marketing is really important for any business. It's really, really worked for us. I'm very big on marketing and that's one of my uh, major goals for this year to really focus on marketing. And I would say, you know what, if you're not doing Facebook As yet, Facebook marketing, it really, really, really works. There are some incredible, you know, YouTube videos that you can actually check out that really will give you a step-by-step guide on how to cater your marketing, to target the right customers for your product. And, you know, you don't even need to pay a dime. I mean, I don't know them off the cuff right now off my head, but you'll just Google Facebook marketing tutorials on YouTube. You'll find that and they really work you do see your return there and it's really cost effective. It's not that expensive. And you also decide on your budget. It depends what your budget is. You don't have to pay a retainer fee or anything of that nature. You know, so I like the flexibility of Facebook ads. It's really effective and it has done wonders for our business. Are you managing all the Facebook ads yourself now? So you're self-taught on that and you're managing them? That's correct. Yes. So I manage the social media. So all the marketing, social media, Facebook, Twitter, we literally do everything ourselves. Uh, we don't have really a lot of support staff. The only support staff that we have will be the packages who are working at our warehouse as well as the artisans who are making the product. But everything, we've also got an accounting firm that does our finances, but every other thing we do ourselves. That is the small business hustle, isn't it? It's like in the early days, you just have to learn how to do everything. <laughs> That's true. And you know what? That's the best way to start because of when you do that, you really know every single channel of your business. So you really know when something is wrong, you know how to fix it because you've been on the ground. That's really the best way. I totally agree with that. I feel like if you start outsourcing things too quickly and you don't actually understand how to do everything that is going on in the business, I just think that that is a very, very fast track to things falling over. Unless you're a big venture backed company where you're bringing in heads of departments and they've got years and years of expertise. Otherwise, like you need to know how to do everything in your own company. Yeah, it's good to keep your team very, very lean. Also that, yeah. Mo and I were just in New York because we had shipped a container of some of our direct consumer products and we had to package those ourselves, but it was too cold for us to complete the packaging And so with that, you realize that, okay, you definitely need, when you do bring a team to do the packaging, they need the right gear so that they can be able to work in those conditions, et cetera. Yes. And you wouldn't have known that unless you had done it yourself. Exactly. Yeah. Um, And then Mo, I want to ask now what your resource is. What do you recommend people look up or read or engage with? I'm not a huge reader, but I definitely do watch YouTube. There's a lady that I watch called Karen Bond. She runs her own design firm in Canada. And she's really the source of inspiration for me. She 
basically has these short clips of a, a, day, a day in the life of an interior designer and you get to follow her around with her business and how she conducts herself in the place of work and how she grows her team and why she increases her team. Sometimes she decreases the team. So that gives me a lot of inspiration. I started watching her before we actually got into the business full time. And now I see that we are pretty much <laughs> almost at her level. And one day I'm hoping that we will have a collaboration. Karen Bon, if ever you're listening to Jasmine podcast, give us a call. <laughs> <laughs> and also Gary V. I don't know if you know Gary V. He's really a big professional for me. I listen to his uh, podcasts, his YouTube videos, his Instagram. I follow him on all of the social media platforms. And he, he kind of gives me motivation to get up and do what I do every day. And, you know, um, I always change my mind all the time. I find myself changing my mind all the time. And, you know, I love how Gary Vee says that you need to be able to change your mind all the time as an entrepreneur because, you know, you get new data all the time. And so you can't work with the same decision all the time. So that's really what keeps me motivated. Those two, Karen Bon and Gary Vee. That's such a great piece of advice. You need to be able to change your mind all the time because you're getting new data. That's very true. Well, thank you both for coming on the podcast and telling us all about Mo's crib. It was great to meet you. Thank you so much, Jasmine. Lovely meeting you too, Jen. Thank you. Hey, did you guys love that? If you did, please drop us a five-star review wherever you listen to podcasts. If you take a screenshot of that review and DM it to us on Instagram, we will send you back a link with free access to our entire on-demand library of business skills workshops. So don't sleep on that. Get on it. Take that screenshot and DM it over to us. Chat to you later.